Welcome to week two, day nine of our study through the Bible. Today, we're going to be talking about the assignment from last time in Genesis 6. And this is People of the Free Gift, where we ground believers in their identity in Christ and equip them to reach those caught in religion. If you're new to the channel, go ahead and click the subscribe button to see more of our content where we study through the Bible here in community here on YouTube. If you want to go back to day one, there's a link in the description down below and then the cards up above where you can do just that. And so let's go ahead and dive in. Our assignment last time was read Genesis 6 and mark every reference to man. Include the appropriate pronouns. However, do not mark sons of God. List what you learn from your markings. Also mark every reference to Noah and list what you learn about him. And so on my notes, I have, um, I just marked uh, the scripture, I did a man in blue and Noah in red. And uh, founding with most of these passages, I only need a few colors. And you can do it uh, pretty easily, uh, honestly, if you just have it on a digital copy on your computer. And then you can do word searches. And so, you know, you can look up man and find every time it mentions man, Noah, every time it mentions Noah. And you can catch a lot of these things. You can't catch the pronouns as easily that way. But let's go ahead and jump in to the passage. And so it says, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. If you want to talk about a verse that has separated a lot of Christians, this would be it. Who are the sons of God and who are the daughters of men? And so uh, the, if you're going to talk about what it says about man in this passage, you need to understand what's going on here. The sons of God, there's one camp that says that the sons of God are this, the line of Seth, the messianic line of Seth. And so they were, they were the believing faction, and then you had the line of Cain, and which that's the unbelieving, you know, uh, section. But then we saw that, you know, there's believers and there's unbelievers in both lines. And so it's not really fair to say, like, one entire family is believing, one entire family line is unbelieving. That sounds honestly like the Book of Mormon to me with the Nephites and the Lamanites. But that aside, I believe the sons of God is a direct reference to a specific class of angels. So now, some have taken the route of saying that that is the language of the divine council that you find in the Canaanite, and Philistine, and Egyptian, and Babylonian um, literature. I don't think that the divine council is a biblical thing, but uh, you're free to have your own opinion. I do think that it takes away from the uniqueness of God uh, if you take that route, but what I, I do think we can agree on is that they are angels. They're a specific group of angels, and they come before God, um, and that actually Satan is sometimes, like in the book of Job, he comes along with these characters, the sons of God. Now, in this case, these are those of that class who chose to intentionally violate their orders. And instead of having an appropriate relationship with humanity, meaning that they're God's messengers on his behalf, in his name, uh, sent in our behalf, then instead they started looking upon the daughters of men. Now these are obviously human women. And they saw that they were fair and they took wives of all which they chose. And right there, that's where some say, well, you can't have angels because Jesus said that we're going to be like the angels we're not going to marry, we're given in marriage. Well, under normal circumstances, angels don't marry or are given in marriage. These are sons of God who I've chosen to intentionally defy and deny that, um, the assignment that, which, for which they have chosen. And if you want to look at what the offspring or what the result is, it says down a few verses later, there were giants 
The word there in the Hebrew is Nephilim, which means fallen ones. There were fallen ones in the earth in those days. The word giants actually comes from the Greek Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew uh, Old Testament, and that was the word gigantes, where we get the word giants, okay? Because it was a descriptive word that they chose because these dudes were huge, okay? And I'm going to get into that in a second. So they were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Now, who are these men of old men of renown? Well, let's think about the Greek titans. You have these half God, half man, you know, like Hercules, um, things of that nature, okay? So in the Greek culture, you have that, but you also have these parallel accounts in all the other civilizations around uh, this day, okay? And a lot of the mythology is based around this concept that the gods came down, had inappropriate relationships with women, and that they gave birth to these half-breed, half-god, half-human half beings, okay? And so... What you have here is you have fallen angels of a specific class who are then, um, they, they, then they, they chose to have relations with human women. They give birth to these kind of mutant offspring. Now, the reason why I say it says in those days and in the days after is that uh, this is key to understanding something when you get into the book of Joshua and even in the story of David and Goliath that you have in 1st and 2nd Samuel, and, which you, and then you even have Goliath's brothers mentioned later on. And in, when they go into the promised land, they, have, they come back carrying these giant grapes, and we were grasshoppers in their sight. You have these characters, they have six fingers, okay? And God specifically tells them to target certain people groups, certain tribes, and you have like Og, King of Bashan. You have all these characters mentioned. And there's no way to really understand that without understanding this passage. It's saying that there were angels of a specific class that gave birth with human women to these half-breed angelic human things called the fallen ones. Okay? And so you, then you have God systematically trying to wipe them off the face of the earth. And that sometimes the Israelites were obedient, sometimes they were not. And then when they were not, they come back to haunt them even later. And so you have this passage. This is not an obscure passage that's just like one-off. If you know, we can agree to disagree, we can agree to disagree. But I believe that this is the interpretation. And I, I, I say it because it's going to help you understand certain passages later on and why they were these huge, gigantic creatures, you know. I call them creatures because they weren't true humans, okay. And God is telling them to systematically wipe them off the face of the earth. Atheists love to throw those verses in our face. But if you understand what's going on in those passages, and of course we'll get to that when we get to those passages. So, moving on from the whole Nephilim thing, Let's go on. The Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is, always, is also flesh, and his days shall be 120 years. Okay? So people argue over whether that's a limiting of the lifespans. And, you know, we saw the incredibly long lifespans up until Noah and the genealogies, and then they start, after the flood, they start going down drastically. And there are reasons for that that have to do with what happened in the context of the flood. So it could be that, or it could be that God's actually announcing at this point that it's going to be 120 years. And notice that this was the span of time that he calls to Noah, 120 years Noah's in his driveway building a boat and as a symbol and a sign to his, his community that was something that was preached on for four generations. If you didn't catch that in our, our weekly message last week, go back and check that out. For four generations, the flood was being taught from Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Okay, Methuselah's name was actually 
means his death shall bring. It was the prophecy of the year that the flood was going to come. And sure enough, the year that Methuselah died is the year that the flood come. But now you have it narrowed down to 120 years when God calls Noah, he's 600 years old, and he says, I want you to build me a boat. Okay, so God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So here we got the state of man. We progress from the time of innocence in Genesis 2 quickly to the fall in Genesis 3 to the first murder of Cain and Abel in Genesis 4. And then by the time you get to Genesis 6, the thoughts of men's heart were only evil continually. How fast sin spread systematically through the human race, through the human condition. We're told here. And so as God saw the wickedness of man's hearts and it repented the God that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But then, and so then, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man. He was a just man, perfect in his generations. Now, here's something that you need to understand. This is another clue. Why did God choose Noah? It says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, but it says he was perfect in his generations and his genealogies. Noah came from a family line that had not been tainted by the sons of God incident. Now, there's a different way that people might read that, but I would say that that's definitely a way in which uh, you could re read that. It's legitimate, and I would say you could take that to the bank, okay? That that is a factor in why God chose Noah to start over, okay? So let's go on talking about Noah, um, because we finished up talking about what it says about men. Now, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And I love that verse. Because a lot of people, they seem to misunderstand the, the story of Noah. They think that Noah was like, that he was doing such a good job, that Noah, that God looks over, he goes, who's the guy that I is doing better than everybody else? I'm going to start over with that guy. Now, Noah happens to be in the Messianic line, okay, the line of promise. But he also has a perfect genealogy. And, but the message of grace, we talked about this, from the time of Enoch, the message of grace was going out to everybody. Now, granted, Nephilim, what you need to understand is Nephilim could not be redeemed, okay? And, you know, so, you know, you're not going to have half-breeds. If God's starting over with Noah to try and deal with that problem, and by the way, another reason why I believe that that, translate, that interpretation is correct is because think about God announcing the garden that the seed of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent. Now, so if God says that the Messiah is going to be the seed of the woman, meaning a human being, it only makes sense from Satan's standpoint that the best way to attack that plan is to go after the purity of the genealogies and the purity of the, the gene pool of humanity. If you can taint the gene pool and make it so that there's no true humans anymore, then God can't bring a Messiah out of that. Okay? Makes sense? So, Noah finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah receives the grace of God he accepts the call of God on his life. And he has three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem is going to turn out to be the one who is the child of promise in the Messianic line. And there's some drama that happens with the other two in Genesis 9. Okay? So, God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. The earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make an ark, gopher wood, Rooms that shall you make in the ark, and you shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which you shall make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window you shall make the ark, and in a cubit you shall finish it above, and the door of the ark shall you set in the side thereof. Okay, so there's a door, and there's some windows. 
Okay, in the lower second and third stories, you shall make of it three stories high, and a little lot of cubits made of gopher wood. Got it? Okay. And then he says, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you and your sons, your wife, your sons, wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring into the ark, keep them alive, male and female, and take, uh, take out of you food that is eaten, and you shall gather it unto you, and it shall be for food for you and for them. And Noah did this according to all that God commanded him, so he did. Okay, so Noah was somebody who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He was obedient to the call of God on his life, and he was blessed richly by it. God starts over uh, with humanity and with the man who um, would be able to, who was surrendered in his heart to him so that he could start over um, in, in, in a way that he couldn't necessarily, I guess, with Adam. Um, and we're going to find the results of this. This is a one-time thing and how God reacts to it as a result of all of that. So uh, if you have any questions about that, go ahead and write them in the comments down below. And I'm going to choose some of them for the weekly Q&A at the end of the week. And so here's your assignment for day 10. Read Genesis 7. Mark every reference to time. Also mark every reference to Noah and to the ark. Make a list of all you learn regarding the ark. So that's your assignment for, tomorrow, for today, and we'll catch you back here tomorrow. And of course, you can find that in the description down below. And so, like I said, if you haven't yet, subscribe to the channel to catch all of our videos uh, studying through the Bible together. And we have uh, lots of other great content here on YouTube as well. Go ahead and give us a thumbs up on the video if you like the content and remember to share this with other people in your life who have been wanting to study the Bible but have been frustrated because they don't feel like they're able to understand it. Invite them to study it in community with us and uh, they can get their questions answered and learn how to be confident studying the Bible for themselves. And until next time, may God richly bless you.